Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Beck Pitt. I'm a researcher at the Open University. I work in educational technology. My background is philosophy. Um, I finished a PhD a few years ago where I was talking about the work of um, Jean-Paul Sartre. And um, this is based around some of the work that I did as part of that thesis. So basically what I want to do in um, this presentation is kind of look at um, the Sartrean concept of play in his early work and kind of what can Sartre um, offer and look at freedom and creativity. I mean, if we think about it, freedom and creativity often talked about within the context of play. Um, obviously, there's a strong, you know, um, something about the work of Sartre, freedom is a core kind of theme in his work. Um, but there's also this kind of unacknowledged discussion of play. So I kind of wanted to spend a bit of time unpacking that concept um, from being a nothingness um, and then also talking a little bit um, at the end of the presentation um, about existential psychoanalysis as well, which connects in with the discussion of play that Sartre has in being in nothingness through the idea and the dichotomy he sets up between play and seriousness. So, okay, so off we go. Oh, it would help if I click the right laptop as well. Okay, great. So, um, I'll just do a bit of an introduction first of all. Um, 20th century French philosopher Jean Paul Sartre is best known for his writing on freedom, controversial political political development, particularly his relationship with Marxism and his later writings on emancipatory violence and his extensive uber, which covers this kind of vast terrain. So if you know anything about Sartre, you know he's written on everything from Flaubert. Um, he documented his trips in the US and Cuba, for example. He's written a lot of plays, got a huge kind of philosophical um, output. But as I mentioned earlier, what contribution can Sartre make to current debates on the concept of play? While a feeling of freedom is often described as occurring through play, what philosophical implications does such a claim have? And what does this tell us about a non-playful existence? Sartre's first major philosophical work, Being in Nothingness, it's published in 1943, um, presents his theory of human existence or ontology. And the world that he kind of describes in Being in Nothingness is one in which we're living primarily in bad faith. It's this idea, it's this world, it's usually described as one where we deceive ourselves. We deny ourselves that we're freedom itself. We, there's an idea in Sartre that we're condemned to be free and we're, we're kind of in denial of this, according to Sartre, in being nothingness. And we're failing to take responsibility for our choices and actions, deliberate or otherwise. And it's also a world in which um, is often depicted and um, as, as being one of conflict with fellow human beings, um, or what Sartre describes as um, for itself, this kind of embodied consciousness um, that's necessarily situated in the world. And this idea of conflict um, with others is kind of pervasive in, in being a nothingness. And it's often kind of taken that this is the only way you can kind of um, uh, inevitable outcome of the way that Sartre kind of sets up the description of existence in the book. Um, and what play does, and this is a kind of side argument I can sneak in in the presentation, is actually kind of argue that actually that's not um, the case. There is a way out and that play is actually the kind of beginning of a kind of um, the development of, of, of a kind of um, set of emancipatory moments that Sartre develops through his work. And it starts off with that he kind of looks at this in being and nothingness through play. So um, contained within being and nothingness is a largely unacknowledged analysis of play, the most pointed and developed discussion, which takes place in fewer than two pages. So we're talking a big book, I wave my copy here in case anyone <laughs> hasn't seen it before, it's pretty big. Um, 580 to 81 in this edition, he spends a little bit of time talking about um, play and he puts this in terms of the dichotomy between play and seriousness and we'll kind of move on and unpack some of that in a bit. Um, yet while the inconclusive analyses that he offers in Being in Nothingness might give the impression that play is a minor and unimportant part of the text, to adopt such a reading I think, would be to underestimate Play's specific and specialised role in Sartre's philosophy. And just quickly as an aside, um, there is um, another couple of places that Sartre talks about um, Play in the text. So you've got this quite famous um, example where Sartre talks about um, an overly keen waiter. You've got this idea of the waiter leaning extravagantly over his clientele, exaggerating gestures, you know, who's allegedly playing at being. Um, Kind of there's a connection I was thinking of role playing and, and some of the stuff that you were you were saying in your presentation um and it's kind of a, kind of used ambiguously in that sense and then there's also at the end which i'm going to come back and talk about at the end of this where he talks about existential psychoanalysis but what he finishes being in nothing that's talking about is a set of ethical questions he kind of raises um specifically ethical questions for his ontology and and highlighting one facet of transformation necessarily 
to try to transcend the state of existence um, described in the text and kind of talks about a needing to be a change in the way that we reflect. And, and you can kind of see this in the text, there's kind of various points where he talks about different forms of reflection, but never really comes to any um, conclusion as such in this book anyway. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, um, often it's kind of talked about that um, kind of common interpretations of being in nothingness kind of imply this world of bad faith and conflict uh, are kind of inevitable. Um, and there is a bit of discussion in secondary literature about the role of play, and I'll mention and pick up on some of this, but um, I'm not really going to cover much about it in this um, presentation. There's a couple of people, so there's a guy called Yi Wei Zeng and Thomas Anderson who kind of talk a bit about this, and there's also Linda Bell, um, and we'll touch on some of these, these people as we move through um, the presentation. Um, but what play will um, go on and indicate is that there is the possibility of transforming certain aspects or even eradicating what Sartre describes as this kind of project of trying to be God. So this is a kind of fundamental project which gives us this kind of seemingly endless task to try and give permanence to our own being while we're simultaneously suppressing our own freedom. Um, so, just to kind of... So there's kind of two things. So Sartre kind of discussion of play kind of does two things. One, it's a kind of um, critique of rather than statement about our existence and secondly I think play indicates and kind of the parameters for what um, I think is a kind of developing emancipatory theory in, in his work um, and this allows us to kind of broaden and situate the concept of play beyond just a list of, of characteristics so without further ado, what I wanted to do now um, is look at the background as to why and how we can kind of reorientate and look differently at, at what Sartre's trying to do, um, trying to do with the idea of play. So um, this is taken from a book called um, Notebooks, or rather a set of, of, of notes um, that, that Sartre kind of wrote a few years after the publication of Being in Nothingness. And he says that the fact that being in nothingness is an ontology before conversion takes for granted that conversion is necessary. So you've got this idea here um, that it's not inevitable um, that the, the, what the book represents is actually a, um, it's illustrative of a pre-transformative state of existence, the world that he's describing in being nothingness, this world of conflict. And secondly, he's kind of, um, the world described in being a nothingness is one that implicitly argues for the need to transform the world. So I'd argue that there are bits throughout being in nothingness where you can point to, he talks about conversion, he talks about radical conversion, he doesn't really give a really full description of what he means by those things but this isn't a retrospective gloss um, or arguably it's not a retrospective gloss what he's saying about the text in notebooks um, what does that actually mean could you explain that yeah sure <laughs> so basically he's saying that what the the kind of um theory of existence that in, in being nothingness the, the the book that he's published in 1943 he's writing in 1946 or thereabouts i think yeah um He's saying that there's some kind of transformation. It takes for granted the world that he's describing is not an ideal one. It needs some kind of transformation. And by describing that world, he's not in some way um, uh, saying that it's um, saying that that's the way things should be, or that that's inevitably um, how we exist. Actually there's something, it's quite obvious that we need to transform and change the kind of conflict that he's saying we have between each other, all this kind of really, um, uh, how just the isn't the right word, um, this kind of, uh, this tension almost, this kind of perpetual um, state of bad faith or being in denial about one's own freedom. We don't have to live in that kind of way. So I think that's what he's saying, and I don't think it's necessarily retrospective. Um, and play is, the, is probably one of the most major ways um, in which he goes about kind of um, unpacking um, some of this. Well, sorry, the word conversion is nothing uh -huh. to do with religion. Actually. No, it's not. And I, I should apologise with the pitch because it kind of applies. Uh, um, so I was finding... <laughs> It's probably more of a trans, yeah. It's 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 more of a transformation, transformative kind of thing. And yeah, it's not really this. Um, so, and just to kind of um, to kind of 
give a bit more for people that aren't um, maybe this, this kind of world that starts describing um, in being a nothingness, he describes in very kind of vivid terms. So you have this idea of the hell of passions, man is a useless passion. You've got this idea of the pursuit of being is in hell and this kind of, from one of his plays, we close, um, hell is other people. You know, you've got this very kind of um, uh, vivid kind of world that he's painting, um, but he's really, what he's trying to do is argue that actually another ontology is possible to kind of um, kind of use a, 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 you know, the idea that another world is possible. Um, so it's less clear, however, um, I mean, there's some points about actually trying to look and reorientate the book and kind of think about it differently. It's less obvious which are the converted and unconverted bits and being nothingness and try and unpack all of that. But um, what I really wanted to do was focus directly in on play. Um, and to start off with, I wanted to kind of turn and look back at War Diaries. So if anyone's kind of, this is written pre-being in nothingness, and um, what Sartre does is a lot of War Diaries, it's written 1939 to 40. Um, it's called Notebooks for Sony War, I think is the kind of description. Um, uh, and what he says is, renouncing the ivory tower, I should like the world to appear to me in its full threatening reality, but I do not therefore want my life to stop being a game. That's why I subscribe wholeheartedly to Schiller's phrase, man is fully a man only when he plays. So Sartre said this in War Diaries. He's got, you can read a lot of what he puts in, um, a lot of the text from Being in Nothingness, you find verbatim in War Diaries. And he develops some of his ideas on play um, in War Diaries and they reappear again in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Being in Nothingness. And Sartre doesn't acknowledge his debt to Schiller in being in nothingness, and neither does, it, does he acknowledge this kind of critical addition to, to, to Schiller's idea. It's the idea of the world appearing in its full threat, threatening reality. Instead, in the latter instance, and highlighting one of the key unique characteristics um, that kind of uh, undercut um, common assumptions about this concept, You've got this kind of reassuring and comforting world of bad faith. So you've got this idea where Sartre describes it as being hellish, as being this kind of conflictual world. But at the same time, bad faith is also described as being very reassuring and comforting. You've got a kind of world where um, it's almost, it's kind of easy to be in bad faith. It's easy in one sense. There's something about the way that we live that kind of encourages us not to um, maybe take responsibility or to kind of um, for, our, for our actions in the way that Sartre would like us to acknowledge our, our, our freedom. So there's this kind of idea of threat. There's a kind of fact that if you kind of strip back, and we'll kind of see this in the description of play, if you kind of strip this back, then the world becomes something quite different. Actually, it's something where you're revealed as being responsible for, for what's happening. Um, so this is kind of there's a bit of a kind of tension there, I suppose, in terms of where, um, how, uh, how um, Sartre talks about this. Uh, it's his description of the poor itself as constantly anguish, this kind of apt description for this constant kind of hidden existential discord, and it's integral to this, this <coughs> kind of being that Sartre describes in, in, in being in nothingness. And so as Sartre describes kind of what he describes as anguish, anguish is precisely, quote, Anguish is precisely my consciousness of being my own future in the mode of not being. So you're, you're kind of, what that means is it's kind of, um, the future is open and possibilities are open, and you're conscious of the fact that, 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 that you're free to choose differently than you made it, or free to choose in it. And that's the kind of, that is anguish precisely because Sartre and in the description that he gives in being in nothingness, we're kind of existing in a constant state of bad faith, or this is the kind of status quo, as it were. Okay, so this bit here. So as I said, there's kind of two um, pages specifically written um, on the, the concept of play um, that I'm going to try and unpack here. And it's situated in the final part of being in nothingness that examines this relationship between having, doing, and being. So this is towards the end of the text. And in describing what action is, we kind of clarify this relationship between the for itself and in itself by revealing the foundation for transformation as being integral to ourselves. And Sartre says, quote, the perpetual possibility of acting must evidently be considered as an essential characteristic of the for itself. This idea of action is, is integral to how we think about ourselves. And moreover, it appears that it's action itself, which, as emphasised, 
in the description of play offers a way of transforming what we could say is unconverted for itself and that has this kind of emancipatory role. So how does Sartre kind of talk about play and seriousness? So this is the kind of dichotomy that I um, talked about earlier. Um, Sartre talks about um, play and seriousness. You have this idea of seriousness in Sartre, which is there's a, there's a connection, a strong connection between that and, and bad faith. And Sartre says the serious man is of the world and has no resource in himself. And this he can, kind of juxtaposes and compares with play. The least possessive attitude, it strips the real of its reality. So there's kind of quite a few um, things going on in, in um, Sartre's description. So he kind of talks about um, the serious man, and I'll come back to this in terms of um, existential psychoanalysis, but for him, the serious man is of the world and has no resource in himself. He does not even imagine any longer the possibility of getting out of the world, for he has given to himself the type of existence of a rock, the consistency, the inertia, the opacity of being in the midst of the world. Um, and he puts this in terms of somebody prioritising um, the object over subject, prioritising um, the world before one's own kind of um, acknowledging and, and kind of um, acknowledging one's own freedom. Um, and he does this in terms of the example of um, kind of interesting um, in the way that he does it. He basically puts, puts this in terms of um, the idea of the revolutionary. He talks for a few paragraphs about um, the revolutionary is kind of embodying this uh, this this idea of the serious man. And that's there's a whole, whole separate argument we have about this. I mean, I think that when he's talking about the revolutionary, what he's actually talking about, he's kind of crit critiquing Stalinism, the time when he's writing um, is, is that kind of period. Um, he's kind of talking about, for example, the French Communist Party, the PCF, and, and so on. And I think there's an argument you can argue that he's not talking about um, uh, He's talking about a particular type of um, type of kind of uh, um, politics, and, and 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 he's talking about Solons in this kind, but that's kind of separate. Um, in this sense, we just really want to talk about and note that he's talking about possession. So he's um, talking about um, uh, appropriation and possession within this context, and this idea of stripping reality as well, of actually kind of removing um, the kind of barriers that we see around, um, that we have around us. He kind of talks very early on in being nothingness about um, guardrails against anguish. There's a kind of description where he talks about signs, um, policemen, um, you know, signs that tell you to, to, to stay off the grass, these kind of things. All these kind of barriers, all these things in the world that kind of prevent us from, from having to make um, decisions or for, from kind of framing and structuring the world that we live in. Um, so he talks about this kind of being stripped back through play, whereas for him, also, the serious person puts too much emphasis on those kind of things. He also talks about play releasing subjectivity. So here, play releases subjectivity. As soon as a man apprehends himself as free and wishes to use his freedom, a freedom, by the way, by the way which could just as well be his anguish, then his activity is play. So as I mentioned kind of earlier, um, Anguish is not necessarily a negative um, thing. Obviously, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable kind of state of being, and you can kind of correspond that with the kind of comfort of the um, per, of the pervasiveness of bad faith. Um, here, Sartre says that through play, you're releasing subjectivity. You're realizing your freedom and you're kind of um, um, setting your own rules, and it kind of comes from from yourself. And this is also kind of counter some of the other examples um, of, <coughs> excuse me, that Sartre talks about. So he kind of talks about people who um, play is almost counterposed to those people who, quote, make the knot a part of their very subjectivity, establish their human personality as a perpetual negation. Or in other words, you kind of have people who, through Sartre's view, objectify um, themselves. Just to recap, these are all kind of quotes coming from this, this kind of section. So just again, um, to pick up on this, Sartre says, the first principle of play is man himself. 
through it he escapes his natural nature. So kind of there's a bit of ambiguity here. So if you could kind of say, well, Sartre talks about um, you know this idea of natural nature. There's a lot of descriptions of things being original and fundamental, fundamental projects and all of these kind of things. I mean, arguably this is just because of, of the way in which the ontology that he's 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 kind of setting up in being in nothingness is one where these things appear as um, being natural and fundamental, um, but they aren't necessarily kind of, you know, um, inevitable. Um, and he says here, he sets himself, he sets and values, sorry, he himself sets and values, oops, is that quite right? I'm not sure. He himself sets and values, rules for his acts and consent, yeah, sorry, it's a bit of a mess up with the quote there. Um, for his acts and consents to play only according to the rules which he himself has established and defined. So, this is kind of, um, I think this highlights a problem actually here with, with Sartre's concept of play. Um, and that is at the moment, it's purely what he's developing is an idea of play that's quite different maybe from kind of conventional ideas of play, but it's also quite individualized. So. One of the kind of um, uh, criticisms that Sartre receives is that he's very, <coughs> it's quite an individualistic um, uh, philosophy or very focused on, on, on um, the individual, um, the way he, he kind of builds up what he's talking about in the text. Um, and again, you can kind of see here that, that Sartre kind of talks about play within um, the framework of, of the individual. The individual is releasing, you know, one is releasing subjectivity, one is um, setting one's own rules, and so on. Um, and there's arguably a kind of um, difficulty there with both in terms of how you then address the kind of structural, um, the kind of challenges of the pervasiveness of bad faith, the kind of structures that Sartre describes, and so on. Those can't alone be overcome by individual kind of, <laughs> you know, setting rules and kind of almost that's kind of happening in its own space. You actually have to tackle the, the, the kind of fundamental inequalities and the kind of problems that he describes collectively. And I think there's something that he does later on with how he develops this theory where, where he kind of, um, not sets right, but certainly develops that. Um, there's also a kind of sense in which he talks about um, play as purifying reflection. So you have an idea of impure and pure reflection in Sartre, um, and play is something that's that's almost kind of, in a sense, beginning that process of, of kind of um, realizing oneself as freedom, you know, releasing subjectivity, kind of realizing that you're responsible for actions, for your actions, and so on, and taking um, responsibility for unexpected consequences, and so on. Um, so Sartre describes play as it's this particular type of project. It has freedom for its foundation and goal, and it deserves a special study. And this never happens in being enough as such, although he does come back into it about seriousness again at the end. Um, it's radically different from all others, and it aims as a radically different type of being. So here he's talking about something quite different. So something quite different than the, than the, um, the for itself and the type of existence that he's been talking about and being nothingness. He actually thinks that it, there's, there's actually... Um, that there is another kind of way that we can exist, where you know freedom is is the aim of what we're doing, rather than aiming at trying to 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 kind of be something in the sense of kind of um, uh, existing in the form of. Um, I suppose a good example is the idea of character. So Sartre, um, in his later work in particular, if you look at something like. Um, when he talks about, um, and I would argue there's a connection between play and, and what is later described as the grief infusion, where he's talking about collective transformation. The example he uses is the storming of the Bastille, um, and this kind of coming together of people to kind of transform and change change um, a situation in, in quite a radical kind of way. And he talks about during this moment of, um, of, of, of the group infusion, you have this kind of loss of character. They kind of lose your your kind of sense of self within the, this the, within within action. And and so I can there's a, there's a connection between these. I would argue, but um, at this stage, um, this is what he's kind of saying here. Okay, so. Um, okay, so I want to kind of. Um, Summarise by I, just that's kind of introducing, like hopefully, um, 
the idea of play and start. I was kind of in, interested in, um, I think there's kind of tie-ins between some of the stuff that we've been that's been talked about earlier about highlighting agency in, in Sartre's work. I think there's some interesting clients with the stuff that Abel was saying, particularly with role play, uh, about the structures and so on. Um, there's a kind of, Sartre kind of comes back at the end to talk about um, existential psychoanalysis within, um, within the context of seriousness. So just before he closes, um, he kind of returns and just before he kind of puts together these, these kind of questions, he kind of says, the principal result of existential psychoanalysis must be to make us repudiate the spirit of seriousness. So he's already set up this dichotomy between play and seriousness earlier, earlier on. And he kind of describes here, we should mention this earlier, but this is the kind of description that he gives of seriousness. He says, the spirit of seriousness has two characteristics. It considers values as transcendent, given independent of human subjectivity, and it transfers the quality of desirable from the ontological thing, the ontological structure of things to their simple material constitution. So he talks about this, this, this attitude kind of ruling the world and that there is a kind of role, as it were, for existential psychoanalysis. And also, if you look back at the for play, to kind of look and address that. I mean, I don't think it, I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts about it. Um, I don't think it necessarily um, resolves um, some of the kind of uh, issues with, with what I would argue is a developing emancipatory theory because there's no kind of understanding of collectivity or collective transformation within that but I'd be yeah I think that's a kind of it's a kind of interesting different take maybe on play so I'll leave it there thank you, thank you. Thank you.